Hey all, new day, new verses. We continue on into Corinthians. Today we're picking up with chapter 2. And, you know, when I was thinking about posting yesterday, I just kept looking at it and, you know, the words just kept getting fuzzy. It's like it just was not supposed to happen yesterday. And, you know, I was reading through it today to post and I think that may be the reason because of where we're going to drop off at verse 8. You know, we're going to go to the end of verse 7 today. Because there's this kind of idea about wisdom. And there's this wisdom the world understands and wisdom the world doesn't understand. And so before we get into it, Lord, Father God, we just come before you. I ask that you would give me the words. Help me convey this to the person you have it for and to whomever you have it for. Get it to that person and just, Lord, get relationship. Get into us. Get get us out of ourselves and get into a deeper place of you so that we can truly rejoice, truly read your word, truly let your word be read into us, Lord God, because it is perfect for, what is it, Timothy, correction and, and refinement and conviction, and Lord, you just, you make us whole with it. So, Heavenly Father, just come in, move in with your Holy Spirit, make us whole. Use this word to correct us and refine us and teach us, Lord God, just be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Starting off at chapter 2. When I first came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. For I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Christ Jesus, the one who was crucified. I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling, and my message and my preaching were very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so you would not trust in human wisdom, but in the power of God. Yet when I am among mature believers, I do speak with words of wisdom, but not the kind of words of wisdom that belong to this world or to the rulers of this world who are soon forgotten. No, the wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God, His plan that was previously hidden, even though He made it for our ultimate glory before the world began. You know, and I, I think the reason for doing today and tomorrow rather than Tuesday or Thursday is just one to be able to talk about here that godly wisdom and tomorrow the world that doesn't quite understand it. You know, because it's easy for us to get resentful toward the world that doesn't understand it. We tend to forget that we were once as lost, we were once as blind. You know, and in forget and thinking that we can see completely, we prove that we still have much to go. You know? I've gotten it everything right, everything good with me and God. Keep but just from my own experience, the moment we get comfortable with who we think Jesus is, the moment we're probably not really wanting to him with to wrestle with us. Cause he gets rid of all of that. You know, if we Yeah, I love everybody and I'm totally okay hating that one person. That's not really it. It's the all should not perish. We're supposed to, I mean, he gave his life as a ransom for many, that all would be saved who chase after him. You know, why Why do we not really, and this, this is one of those kind of things that gives me a chuckle for a moment, because like, Jehovah's Witnesses, if memory serves, is the 144,000 number in Revelation is taken, literally, yet these guys are pounding the feet, talking about it, to, pounding the pavement, talking about it to everyone and every, and anyone. Yet we who are closer to the truth, who are meant to be saved, and, and I'm not, no, it's, what's in here? Sufficiency of scripture. I, you know, the conversation, because that's the thing, it's not coming about interacting with the world that doesn't know with wise words or anything like that. We're not trying to kowtow, we're not trying to make somebody feel lesser. Because the truth is, if we're truly walking this out, when we see somebody who's lost, we remember that we are found. And so we want others to be saved as well. You know, instead of being okay with God doing that little bit for us and our going about our day just strolling around, ignoring the rest of the world around us, we should be acting like the friends of that crippled who ripped open the roof and lowered him down in front of Jesus. It's like, well, but we don't interrupt protocol. We want to do it a certain way. And then don't get me wrong. There is protocol stuff that we'll talk about in Corinthians later on about church decorum and stuff like that. And I just think that bold faith moment to say, hey, you know what? You are healer. This, this is broken. This is wrong. This needs to be fixed. 
You know, it's not about pointing out in somebody else who we barely know from Adam or Eve, saying, oh, well, this is their fault, and that's their fault, and this is their fault, and that's their fault, and being an armchair, you know, preacher about it. It's about being able to be our brother's keeper. A steward in somebody's life who hears what other people are going through, hears each other's story, listens, you know, corrects to somebody who has that close connection. Is if we try to use wise and worldly words, we're just going to end up cutting each other to ribbons. You know, this is about existing by the power of the Holy Spirit. Not just functioning for unbelievers so that they might become believers, but functioning in our day to day, recognizing that we cannot do it without Him. You know, it's not going to the church for a fill up of Holy Spirit petrol every couple of weeks or every week. You know, oh, by stop off on Sunday, I get a refill on Wednesday, and I'm good till Saturday as long as I don't deal with my great aunt Bessie. Not Christianity! Religion! Hell of a religion, don't get me wrong. A <laughs> religion that's far and wide across this great world of ours. It, not relationship. Relationship is recognizing that we can't do it. We can't do it alone, and the beautiful part is we're not. All, all we have to do is turn away from the world and look to Him. I mean, that is true understanding of him as master and king. We forsake all else, all others, even the altar and idol that is me. You know, my way of doing it, my expectations, my hopes, my time and date stamp. You know, oh, God said I would be in a house by this day and this month. If he says it, that's one thing. And he who has said it is faithful to complete it. There's a dramatic difference, though, between God saying it'll happen now and us going to God and saying, well, if it doesn't happen by the 13th of June, then you just don't care about me. That's a toddler's reaction. That's a religion's reaction. And that's the, the Isaiah, well, we sang the songs, but you didn't dance, and, and we mourned, but you didn't weep with us. It's because God does not come at the beck and call. <laughs> we are his. He is our God. He's not our genie. He is not some, you know, we get to come and go and use and abuse him. He is king. We follow him. Our lives look like his. He does not look like us. We look like him. That is that is the Adom Adomai. The humanity from the clay of the earth. We do not, uh, he does not look like us. We look like him. We are the image bearers. He is the potter who molds us. He is the potter who makes each and every single one of us, every life, every nefesh, whether it be our fellow human beings of every shape, color, size, stature, and form, or the nefeshes of the fur babies around us, or the plants. We're all his handiwork. That fact is what should make us care more. Like, wait, 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 you're kind enough to let me get to explore? To play on this playground? I mean, yeah, there are a couple bullies on it. And yeah, there are a couple people who like to throw sand in other people's eyes because it makes them feel better. But most of those people were abused. Most of those people are serving some kind of evil that they have no idea about. There are some who actively do choose that path, consciously. But most of the lost, the hurting, and the broken are simply that, lost, hurting, and broken. And if our lives are not a city on a hill, shining out that God is King who sees us through the wind and the wave and the storm, who is God of the mountain and the valley, who is God of dry land and the wind and the waves and the sea, our lives aren't looking like that, well, no wonder they get confused. No wonder the outside gets lost and frightened and doesn't get it. When we try and use our language, and yet we look like we've never been transformed by a single word in here, well, no wonder the world gets confused by our hypocrisy. And it's not a knock, it's an acknowledgement. If we own the fact that we fail, we would recognize how much more we want everybody to receive grace. Because it's in owning our failures that we recognize how much grace we've been given. 
You know, the guy who'd been given the, 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 the unforgiving debtor parable, right? The guy who had been give, forgiven five million, he had to understand how much he had been forgiven. If he had, it would have been easier for him to forgive. Not as a look at to say of how horrible he is. A glance at to remember when I was still dead to him, he died for me. Now when sin entered this world, God already had a plan, and it's right there in Genesis. His head, his heel will, he will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. That is the first messianic promise. That in killing this enemy evil, he will be struck down in doing so. Really kind of blows my mind that basically chapter 3 has the promise of the Messiah right there. And, and it's, it's foreshadowing Jesus thousands of years before anything before he ever came on the scene, before Rome was even a thing, before Greece was a written language, let alone a spoken one, he had planned. Before Babylon ever built a tower or wrote in cuneiform or Sanskrit, before word was ever written down, he had planned. You know, Jeremiah 29.11, the actual context there is it's written to people in exile that have gone through losing their world. And it is God saying, I still know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to curse you. This means that when we are going through exile, when we are going through trials, when we are going through sufferings, when we are going through storms, we trust that the Lord will never leave us nor forsake us. We trust that when we are in exile, which we are, doesn't matter the Babylon you're in. I'm not in the United States, Canada, but, you know, whole Yakko's line of them. Argentina, but, yeah, all of them. They all become Babylon in the end. Any nation that puts itself up as God instead of kneeling before the one true king becomes Babylon in the end. The exile we're in is in the now and the not yet. We are living in the promise. We are waiting for the promised land to come. The new Jerusalem, see Revelation. We are in exile, folks. We don't live like it, though. We live more often than not like the Israels in Bameba, in Numbers, into the wilderness in Hebrew. We get manna from heaven and then we complain that it's not to our favor or our flavor leading the literal bread of angels and complaining that it doesn't taste as good as the meat of Egypt, which, newsflash, slaves didn't really get meat. Yeah, no. So they're trading promise for delusion because the chains were more comfortable than the unknown. Because they weren't focusing on the fact that they serve the God who knows. They were worried how they were going to do it in their own strength, how they were going to do it in their own wisdom, how they were going to do it in their own power. And when we do the same, no wonder we get lost in the thicket. No wonder we have a lost generation wandering around in the wilderness. There haven't exactly been a ton of Caleb's and Joshua's. There have been a few. And God always rises them up. Always, always raises them up. Because God always has a remnant. He always has that faithful remnant. The reason we have the Bible in the first place is because of his faithful remnant. Kings is not written by people. You know, history is written by the victors. First and second kings are written by people who are calling the leadership morons. Yeah, this is the king, and they screwed up here, screwed up here, screwed up here, screwed up here, screwed up here. Northern Israel, not a single one of them. Southern Israel, or southern Judah, one, two, I think in all actuality, it's like four, maybe eight, somewhere in there. It's less than ten out of all of them. It's not a book written by the victors. This is a book written by the minority. We forget that because after Constantine, Christianity took a massive boom. And after Christianity took over the Roman Empire, it spread like wildfire. So we don't really remember that this is a minority report. 
This is a word to the remnant who trust after the Lord alone. This, this is a promise to those who believe he who is promised is faithful to complete it. That's, that's the promise. That's the difference. That's whether or not we are in exile as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Belshazzar, are, Daniel, as they did, or doing it like the children of exile who lost a generation in the wilderness. Are we going to rejoice when his bounty comes? Are we going to rejoice when he provides? Well, it didn't look the way I wanted it to. I didn't realize you were God, Mac. Pretty sure when we need a miracle, it's not about telling God what the miracle looks like. It's just needing the miracle. God, who knows the desires of our heart, hears us. His Holy Spirit makes t prayers out of our sighs and aching groans. He knows the number of hairs on our head. He collects every tear. He has always held us in his hand and never let us go. He hears our needs. He wants us to tell them to him because even though he knows them, he likes to listen as though it were the first time. Because that's love. If you've got a spouse and you're listening to this, you know exactly what I mean. You could have heard the same story from your spouse 10,000 times and it may annoy the crap out of you every single time you hear it, but you listen to it because you love the person telling the story. And because deep down you know if the person who was telling the story wasn't there, you would miss that story more than anything you could think of. Because it's from the person. That's the love he has for us, and it's deeper than that. That is but in a mere darkly what the kind of beauty we're seeing. It is but a taste, but a reflection an echo, a whisper. <laughs> a whisper of an echo of reality. And it's his reality that invades us, gets into us, moves in us, makes us whole, makes us new, makes us bold. It is new wine. We have to be the new wine skins ready for it. And that means taking up our cross and following Him. That means laying down our versions of wisdom. It means laying down our versions of life. And asking Him what He wants us to do. Because the most important commandment is to love the Lord our God, to listen and respond to Him, to chase after and worship Him with our muchness. Our whole beings, everything that He put in us. We give it as an altering of praise. And we give it in worship and surrender because He gave it to us to Him in the first place. It's all about utter devotion to Him. Well, what about not our problem? And those questions like that, we don't raise to inside our heads to be beaten up. We put them before the throne. I have this fear, Abba, but I know you will see me through about it. Because that's, that's what whatabouts really are. They're fear. And they become a fear that we choose to worship instead of trusting the God who can. We don't remember, we don't realize that our lives are supposed to rely only on the power of the Holy Spirit, only on Him. This a, a wonderful friend of mine, Darrell, reminded me to forever rely on God. No, it's not just a cute acronym for Sunday school. It's a truth. It is to forever rely on God. You know, one of the upsides of getting to help out in the youth ministry is, you know, hey, you get to babysit. Oh, okay. <laughs> First time I ever saw it. There's a little sticker and or a little magnet. And <laughs> she's remembering to rely on him. In everything. And that's not to say that we let that we stop being part of life, that's saying that we become more a part of life. By being more a part of him and less a part of ourselves. He moves in us and takes away everything that's not meant to be there. The resentment, the anger, the fear. 
the denial, the heartache, the pain. It's the now and the not yet. We can have Eden promised peace now because we serve the King of Peace. Even if we're not, even if heaven is not here yet, we are still seated in heavenly places. And we can walk it. And we can live it. And we can do it. And it's just about surrendering to Him. It's just about knowing that in our weakness, He's made strong. So it's not about hiding a weakness, it's about owning a weakness. I can't do this, but I know the God who can. And that's the beauty of it. We are servants, we are friends to the one who can. The one who has conquered the world. Who told us to fear not, for we are more than conquerors because he has conquered the world. So why do not we walk with that bold faith that says, No, I am more than a conqueror. So this reality, this mirror, this shadow, this temporal, temporary, this finite, this will have to correct itself because reality has spoken. The brokenness will have to be made well and healed because reality has spoken. The brokenheartedness, the loss, the heartache, the sorrow, the places we're feeling like you could never live again are taken care of because of the power of the cross. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. If we are free by the power of His blood, Romans 8.28, if we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths, if He is our King, He will settle for nothing less. So let's not fight him. Let's surrender to him. I mean, there's a reason that Paul depicts himself and the other apostles as slaves to Christ. And that Jesus says, you're no longer called slaves, but friends. Because slaves don't get to get on on what the master is doing. Friends do. God is revealing this wisdom to us because he loves us. Because he wants us to understand. Because in a world that says, I know what I'm doing, God wants to prove just how foolish the statement is. Because we don't. And going through a pandemic, I'm fairly certain that it sums it up to pretty much everybody. Unless the answer was, I trust God. Mm. What do you do? Well, they say it's okay, and they say it's not, and they say do this, and they say do that. I'm just going to do what God says, because at this point, nobody knows what the hell they're doing. But that's okay. The only reason we get ashamed of it is because we're trying to fulfill a role we were not supposed to do in the first place. We live by the power of the Holy Spirit, and remember, God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. He puts us where He wants us. Time and place. He will put us exactly where He wants us. It's just about chasing after Him. Following those unctions. You know, if you're a fan of elevation, this is the way. Walk in it, right? If we're listening to that, then we're walking wherever He has us go. So we're not going to stumble. Because we're going where He has us to go. Even if it's led into the wilderness, we don't have to stumble because he'll see us through. It's just whether or not we truly want to trust that the one who gives it and says it is faith to complete it. And I'll leave you with that before we come back tomorrow, God willing to pick up with verse 8 and go on through. Is When we try to play by world's wisdom, we're always going to end up at a dead end because the world is dying. These are the birth pains of the new creation. So how can the wisdom of things that will pass away understand the wisdom of the infinite? How can the temporary understand the infinite? 
how can the 2D understand the 3D? And this isn't that small of a jump. This is a much, much greater one. This is like a point understanding a tesseract. He reveals his wisdom to us through love. It's all his to give in the first place. It's just if we trust him to do it. Because he said it, do we believe it? Abraham did. And it was counted to him as righteousness. Lot's wife didn't. She turned around and turned into salt. Which do we want to be? Believer or scoffer? And the real question of that is what's in here. Because it's easy to scoff at things we don't understand. And once we understand it, you never want to leave. Because it's a different kind of wisdom. It's a different kind of reality. And it's the real version of truth. Till then, I'll see you then. May his favor be upon you, and know that you're loved.